and thank you for joining us for the first episode of Hijra Talk. I'm your host, Timothy Caldas. Uh, joining me today is Parastu Hasuri. She's a researcher and consultant who works on migration and refugee issues. Uh, she's worked with UNHCR and has also taught refugee law at the American University of Cairo. Thank you so much for joining us My today. My pleasure. Um, let's start with the basics. We're, we're talking about migration uh, throughout this program. How would you define migration? How would you define a migrant? Who, who, who qualifies or who is included in this? Okay. You know, the broadest definition of a migrant basically states that a migrant is any person who leaves uh, their place of habitual residence, meaning the place that they were born and raised in. And uh, this broad definition of a migrant uh, includes people who leave uh, you know, their place of habitual residence, whether they cross a border or also uh, whether they move internally within their own country. It doesn't matter you know, why they left. Uh, it doesn't really matter if you've left voluntarily or involuntarily. <coughs> and that's a distinction that we'll talk about later. Mm -hmm. um, the legal status doesn't matter. And uh, even the length of time doesn't really matter in this broad definition. So it's actually a, it's a pretty huge category of people. Um, the International Organization of Migration says that there are today roughly 244 million international migrants, so mm -hmm. people who have been, who have, have migrated outside of their own country, their, their country of birth. Mm -hmm. That's, that sounds like a very substantial figure. Um, but can you give us a better feel for like how that fits into the historical uh, trends of migration? Is this is this really a big spike? Because there's in the news you're hearing a lot more about migration lately. You're hearing a lot of concern about it, and 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 the sense that people get is that it's it's growing at a very rapid pace. Mm -hmm. what, what would what do you say about that? Uh, the current uh, total number of migrants on a global level uh, taken, which as you said is uh, 244, I've also read 250, but you know, it, it's in that general sort of ballpark. Um, taken as a percentage of the world population as a whole, which is uh, over 7 billion now, is uh, something like 3.3%. And this figure, even though it has you know, increased maybe marginally in the past uh, couple of years, uh, has been pretty steady for the past uh, decade or so. In fact, uh, you know, one of the biggest uh, sort of periods of migration was migration from Western Europe to the Western Hemisphere um, in the sort of like 19th and early 20th century, when the global population was uh, far, far less than it is now, and something like 50 million Europeans went to uh, North America. So uh, historically, that was a much bigger sort of age of migration than what we are seeing today. I think that the um, there's been a lot of sort of hysteria created around uh, you know migration and where, where we've actually seen that in you know past uh, waves of, uh, of migration uh, you know countries have in fact been able to um, uh, absorb uh, uh, migrants and, and, and migrants have sort of integrated over time, even if they're sometimes, you know, very short-term initial sort of uh, periods where, it, you know, it may take some time for the, for the, for the migrants to, uh, to integrate to the, uh, to the country they're in. I think the recent hysteria over the, you know, so-called uh, migration crisis uh, again, is is a bit of a sort of uh, artificial one. Um, I mean, for sure, the you know the war in Syria had a, an unprecedented sort of level of displacement. Um, I do think it's important to note that, and you know, uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll uh, you know we'll talk about this some more. But it, it is important to note that even the displacement as a result of that war, most people uh, you know went to neighboring countries, and it wasn't really called a refugee crisis until people started trying to get to Europe. You know, it was not being referred to as a crisis when they were remaining in the in the country of origins. And just, uh, just one other thing I want to, to ask about is when we talk about migration, a lot of times the emphasis is on irregular migration, mm -hmm. um, undocumented migration. Is that is that the majority of, of what we're seeing? Is that it, do most people move with or without uh, legal permissions in yeah. place? You know, by definition, uh, irregular migrants are undocumented. We don't have accurate statistics on the number of irregular migrants, but. Uh, of the you know 240 something million migrants, uh, irregular migrants you know con do not cons by any means cons constitute a majority of those migrants. Uh, so most migrants are actually uh, moving regularly. Um, even within irregular migrants, uh, you know you sometimes have people who first came to whatever country regularly, then became irregular migrants. You know they maybe overstayed their visa or had a problem uh, changing from one visa category to another. 
Um, the thing to, to, to realize is that irregular migration really people resort to irregular migration when there's an absence of legal channels for migration. If there were legal, you know, regular, safe, orderly ways for migration, people wouldn't do it irregularly, right? They wouldn't put themselves in these, uh, you know, take these perilous journeys, give money to smugglers. And so you're saying that this is fitting within historical trends mostly that we've already seen, that we haven't actually seen dramatic uptick in the number of migrants. Uh, we're seeing, though, a lot of attempts at blocking migration, mm -hmm. uh, restricting migration. As you mentioned, that this is this is a, a, a phenomenon of the last century. Uh, what are the potential costs of doing that? Uh, if it is such a, a a staple of human history that people are always on the move, what, what what could the consequences be for trying to limit or prevent that? Okay. Well, first of all. Um, I mean, history has shown us that it's actually not possible to prevent migration. So, I mean, uh, or any sort of attempt to prevent migration ends up sort of either divert, you know, creating other migration routes or, I mean, just to give you one example, um, for instance, uh, in the United States, um, uh, when immigration enforcement started to become a lot stricter, the U.S. created penalties uh, on irregular migrants if you know if you were found to be someone who had remained in the United States unlawfully you would then if you ever left the US you would be legally barred from re-entering the US for years and years mm -hmm. what this actually ended up doing was uh, creating an incentive for people who in, were in the US irregularly to remain in the US so basically what I'm saying is like for instance uh, farm laborers who maybe came on seasonal you know on a seasonal basis, because it became harder to come and go, would we'll just remain in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just one example from the U.S. Uh, in the context of, you know, let's say the migration to Europe and the Mediterranean route, what we've seen is that when there's been more patrolling, let's say, of the Eastern Mediterranean route, uh, migrants started using the Central Mediterranean route. When the Central Med Mediterranean route was um, policed, people started going more towards the Western Mediterranean. Um, so, so that's one part of the equation that it's, you know not really possible to block migration. Um, but the other thing is that the cost of blocking migration is also high because, um, you know, migrants are necessary. And I think at a certain level, uh, world leaders actually do understand this. Um, First of all, the remittances that migrants send back home uh, is really, really significant. There are whole economies in certain countries like the Philippines that are highly dependent on remittances. Uh, but also they provide, you know, labor um, in uh, many sectors where the countries that they're migrating to actually need, uh, need this workforce. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of the most important work, you know, nurses, for instance, are often migrant workers in many countries. Um, all sorts of other healthcare workers, agricultural workers, as I said. Um, uh, I mean, there's there's many different categories. So it's uh, it would actually be hurting the economy of many countries if they actually try to stop migration. If it's if it's damaging to the economy and it's uh, and it's also not really feasible, then it's so, on some level, what do you think is what is driving this this sense that you have to get a handle on migration? Because populations often feel that it, that there's a burden that comes with hosting migrants. Mm -hmm. um, does the data support that? Is it, it is there a, a burden on states when they take in migrants? And if if that, if not, then uh, what's what's the reality? So um, I mean, there have been you know study uh, after study that have shown that in general, actually, migration has net benefits for most of the countries that uh, migrants go to. Um, Unfortunately, it is very easy to, uh, you know, the, the migration is sort of a, it's a complex, multifaceted, uh, you know, phenomena, and uh, in media you often see, uh, you know, just one dimension of it sort of explained or uh, reduced to, a, you know, one single sort of dimension. Um, the reality is that, for instance, uh, most, especially nowadays, I mean, in the United States, uh, since really the 1990s, in Europe, um, more since the austerity measures that have been implemented, you know, migrants, especially, you know, so-called irregular migrants, aren't actually even eligible for the state benefits that people think they're taking advantage of. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, migrants have to be self-reliant. Um, in many instances, migrants are very, you know, resourceful. They're very entrepreneurial. I mean, the decision to sort of leave the country that you've known and lived in your whole life is not one that people take lightly, right? So, yes. a lot of migrants actually create jobs. They've revitalized a lot of, uh, you know, uh, cities. 
and um, their labor, as, as we said before, is essential, and also demographically, especially in countries with low birth rates, mm -hmm. uh, they actually need migration in order to be able to, uh, uh, you know, provide for an aging population. But, you know, but the problem is that it's very, there's really no political cost to scapegoating migrants, you know, because especially uh, when they're not, uh, you know, citizens of a country, they don't vote, they don't have the power to, you know, exercise, uh, you know, they don't have the ability to exercise political power. So there's no real political cost to scapegoating uh, migrants, and um, it's, you know, easier to scapegoat and blame migrants for economic policies or for, you know, for economic problems where the root of the problem may actually be the country's own, you know, um, um, economic sure. policies. If we look at the numbers in a number of uh, prominent developed countries, the United States hosts roughly a fifth of the world's uh, international migrants. Uh, they have about 45 million of them. Uh, in Canada and Australia, you have very large migrant populations, 22 and 28 percent respectively. So does that challenge this idea that like that the that countries can't absorb them? Because in Europe, you seem to have the suggestion that they that they're reaching a saturation almost. Mm -hmm. Uh, but do, what is what is the examples of, of these countries that are more historically uh, uh, tied in with migration mm -hmm. offer other uh, other countries uh, in that respect? I think you know even you know there have been suggestions that you know um, you know like Europe has a population of 500 million. Even if uh, you know all of the Syrian refugees were to actually be taken by Europe and and dispersed equally, um, it, it would you know it would be an easily absorbable population. The problem is when you have policies where the burden you know or the responsibility for dealing with migrants is shouldered by just a few countries and some countries you know completely absolve themselves of any responsibility for for it. So. I think sure. that's uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I think that from what I understand, the uh, the numbers in the neighboring countries are dramatically uh, higher, particularly as a proportion of population. Lebanon, one in four mm -hmm. people are a refugee. Uh, in Turkey, even it's one in twenty-three. Whereas in some of the highest populations in Europe, you see one in forty, for example, yeah. in Sweden, or one in eighty in in Germany. So it, it does seem that uh, there might be uh, a lot more room actually mm -hmm. uh, than is at, at times conceded. How many how many refugees are there total globally? So at the moment, the estimated uh, number of refugees globally is about 25 million. So um, I mean, this is basically, I believe, something like 0.3 percent of the population of the world. So it's less than half a percent of the world population. Right. And yet, you know, sometimes if you look at a newspaper, and especially in some of the European countries, you would think that you know half the world's population are refugees. Right. But it's really uh, because even within the sort of uh, you know what uh, what are referred to as forcibly displaced uh, people, uh, the majority are internally displaced. So refugees, who by definition have to have crossed an international border, constitute only you know um, 25 million of the something like 68 million uh, forcibly displaced people. Okay, so it, you're talking about basically 10 percent, roughly, yeah. of the international migrant yes. population. And uh, the only thing that I will say, though, is that. Um, the, the one trend that is a bit concerning is that uh, more refugees are s uh, refugees for a long time. What it means is that they're in protracted refugee situations. Yep. Um, because in theory and ideally refugee status should be something temporary. You know, you become a refugee and then hopefully you find another place that gives you protection and you're able to sort of uh, permanently settle. Uh, but you increasingly have refugees in protracted refugee situations because conflicts have become longer, more intractable, because it's been harder to find alternative solutions for refugees. So that is one concerning thing, but uh, you know, it's uh, it's a, it's a relatively easily solvable problem um, if you know if there were collective sort of uh, commitment on uh, so basically if we spread the uh, right exactly the and, and or if we took more seriously you know um, efforts to actually you know like end you know bring an end to some of the conflicts that have caused you know refugee flows sure of course uh, better to stop the problem from starting yeah. in the first place um, overall though so from what I understand, we're roughly seeing, today we're seeing one of the largest refugee populations since World War II. Mm -hmm. Are there other historical examples of large increases in the refugee population globally, and how did the world react to those? Uh, 
and how does it compare to what we're seeing today? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, the uh, again, um, even though the three biggest refugee producing countries in the world are Afghanistan, Syria, and South Sudan. Um, and Syria, you know, uh, has a much larger refugee population than South Sudan and Afghanistan at the moment. But if we compare uh, the war in Syria to some other significant wars that have happened in the past, let's say, four or five decades, uh, and the sort of displacement that those wars produce and the response, we very clearly see the politicization and the polarization of the uh, refugee issue. So during the, you know, Vietnam War, uh, for instance, um, there was a large amount of displacement all throughout Southeast Asia. Um, what happened is that uh, a comprehensive action plan was put into place. A bunch of countries met in Geneva, and uh, there was a sort of collective responsibility and action taken to uh, address the displacement. And so the United States took something like uh, 1.4 million Southeast Asians, so, you know, Laotians, Cambodians, Vietnamese. Uh, let's look at Greece, for instance. Right now, you know, Greece has been a lot in the news because, of course, again, rightly, in 2015, uh, they had this sort of record number of uh, arrivals by sea, something like 850,000 mm -hmm. refugees reached uh, Greece by sea. Now, most of those people left Greece. At the moment, there's something like 70,000 refugees in Greece and the Aegean Islands. 70,000 is really not a large population when you compare it to how many refugees are in even Egypt or Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey. Um, by contrast, uh, after the Balkan Wars, something like uh, 400,000 Albanians went to Greece, mm -hmm. and at the moment, estimated, you know, maybe 170 to 180,000 have taken on Greek citizenship. I think it's also it's interesting that I mean, when we think about migration, we think we we're always focusing on the fact that this 244 million person population is it has become a migrant. Uh, that's 3.3 percent of the world, which means that nearly 97 percent of people do not migrate. Mm -hmm. And it, it strikes me that that might actually be a kind of remarkable in the, in the other sense. Right? Why aren't more people migrating, uh, given all the incentives that exist for that and uh, the perceived desirability of migration uh, on the part of many? Yeah, exactly. As you say, the overwhelming majority of, of, of people do not migrate. Um, or if they're migrating, they're migrating internally within their countries, right? So we don't we don't notice it. I mean, there's obviously, like in Egypt, a high degree of rural to urban migration. That's why Cairo has a popula the population that it does. But no one is standing at the border of Cairo and saying, you know, uh, if you're from Tanta, you can't come. Or if you're from the Said, you right. can't come to Cairo. So there is internal migration, obviously, within countries. But in terms of international migration, yes, it's still, uh, you know, a small percentage of the global population, and um, I think it's, you know, I mean, it's, you know, it's hard to know why people, you know, don't migrate. We know why the, the reasons why they do migrate. Mm -hmm. I do think that uh, it's very possible that uh, more people will migrate, even though we say that this 3.3 percent has been fairly steady now for, for, for a while. Um, the trends seem to indicate, you know, if things continue to go as they as they are in terms of uh, climate change and environmental uh, disasters and development-induced issues, that you know more and more people uh, may may migrate in the in the future. Which I think is why there actually does need to be, uh, uh, you know, a sort of paradigm shift and a more committed effort to creating uh, legal channels for migration. Um, I think that uh, the current you know framework that we have addressing migration uh, is in a, inadequate, you know, that there is a sort of um, uh, artificial distinction made between voluntary and involuntary migration, uh, that, uh, you know, so-called economic migrants, you know, who are seen as uh, migrating uh, purely for, a vol you know, voluntarily, uh, it's not really taken into account that, uh, you know, sometimes uh, it's real destitution and lack of opportunities, uh, and like political corruption and economic corruption, and uh, that that are driving you know uh, people to migrate for economic reasons. Um, and I think that uh, we we really need uh, a sort of legal framework that will uh, that will take all of this into account. And I think this is why you know one of the things that the Global Compact on Migration was hoping and attempting to do, but uh, but as I said, it's uh, at this stage, you know, not a binding, uh, you know, resolution, and uh, is missing some sort of key participants. So, um, thanks. This was really helpful, uh, really informative. So, uh, so. You had a lot of great insights, and uh, I really appreciate it. Um,
And thanks so much for uh, for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you all for uh, for joining us as well and uh, following along. And I hope that the uh, that the information provided was useful and uh, gives you kind of a new sense of what's going on in terms of migration. And I hope you continue to follow us as we explore this extremely important phenomenon.